uh, it's, it's, it's an honor for me tonight to uh, introduce Pastor Corey Turner as he comes. He's just recently taken over Bridge Church, which is 95 years plus old. He's the seventh campus pastor or senior pastor that oversees six different campuses, five or six different campuses. There's 5,000 people in Pastor Corey's church that he facilitates and manages. And as he comes to bring the word tonight, I want to encourage you, come on, let's get loud, let's get hungry, let's put our hands together as Pastor Corey comes. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 3 verse 1. <coughs> Acts chapter 3 verse 1, I want to read through to verse 10. Thank you so much for your, your love, your hospitality, and, and I just love your pastors, and I love the heritage and history of this house. I believe that uh, Surf City Church is in the bullseye of God's plan and purpose at this time, and that God is wanting to turn those things that the enemy is meant for evil into good for you. And uh, one of the reasons why I keep coming back is not just because of the relationship that I've got with, had with pastors Richard and Erica, but also with uh, Justin and Chrissy, but it's, but it's also because I just believe that there is prophetic destiny in this house that needs to be birthed, it needs to be spoken to, it needs to be declared, and I'm committed to seeing city churches just flourish and multiply. Thank God for what He's doing in the suburbs, but it begins in the city. It begins downtown and what's downtown starts to flow into the outer regions and areas and there's, there's revival on this house. There's a spirit of revival on this house. It's on Jason and Naomi. It's on different people in this room. There is the, the mantle of revival and you've got to contend for it. It will only be birthed through prayer, faith and action. Prayer, faith and action. And so I want to speak to something called the normal Christian life tonight. What is the normal Christian life? Well, the Bible says in Acts chapter 3 verse 1, now Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask money of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive money. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms or money. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. We're speaking about the normal Christian life. The first miracle I saw as a young man as a, in my early, early adolescent years was of someone being ministered to who had a leg significantly shorter than the other and they were wearing a shoe that had been built up at least a couple of inches if not three inches. They took the shoes off and you could see the noticeable difference and this person was prayed for and I literally in front of my eyes saw the right leg just shoot out and grow right in front of me. Now, as a young man, that impressed me and impacted me so much. But what it did do is it developed within me an appetite for the supernatural. You see, if you don't have an appetite for the supernatural, you won't walk in the supernatural. If you're not hungry for it, you won't be filled with it. I've seen 20, talk about praying for barren couples all over the earth, 27 barren couples have now got children in their home because of the prophetic word of the Lord that has come through our ministry into their lives. And obviously they had something to do with it as well. But, but I've seen now so many miracles and things take place that, that I'm just convinced that the normal Christian life is a spirit-filled, supernatural, miraculous life and, and as much as I've seen miracles, we've got to keep contending for more. Because <coughs> there are still people 
that are in desperate need of the miracle working power of God in their lives. God never intended testimonies and stories, both in the Bible and in everyday life, to entertain us. He meant them to inspire us to believe for our own miracles. Some of us have got to stop reading the testimonies and stories of what happened in the past, and we've got to start believing that God is going to do the same thing through our lives. I don't want to become a professional explainer of why nothing happens in the kingdom of God. Some preachers and teachers are professional explainers of why God doesn't do something. God does not need you to advocate for Him as to why things aren't working. What He needs is a believer to rise up and to start to step out in faith and actually put God's Word to the test and see that His Word shall not return to you void, but it shall accomplish what He sent it out to perform. I don't know about you, but I just get sick and tired of hearing Christians talk about, well, I tried tithing one time and it didn't work, so I don't tithe. Or I prayed for the sick, a sick person one time and they didn't get healed, so I don't pray for that anymore or I don't believe for it. John Wimber literally prayed for nearly 10,000 sick people before one recorded miracle but the 10,000 and first person he prayed for who got healed, every single person after that got healed. How much is it going to deter you? What is it going to take to deter you to stop believing for the supernatural, miraculous intervention in your life? Don't say you tried tithing once and it didn't work and so you stop right there. We don't tithe for a breakthrough tomorrow. We tithe as an act of worship because it's who we, what, who we are, what we do, and in the process of good stewardship and faith, God blesses us. We don't pray for a sick person one time. So what if you didn't get the word of knowledge right or you didn't get the prophecy right? Load the guns again, head back out onto the streets and share the word of the Lord again. We've got to build an empowering culture where it's okay to risk it for the biscuit. It's okay to fail. It's okay to actually mess up. But God is not so much interested in your one-time prophecy. He's interested in a lifestyle of faithfulness where you just keep going and you just keep sharing and you just keep praying regardless of what you're not seeing right now. Miracles are a manifestation of the kingdom of God. The Bible says, Jesus says, if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons amongst you, then know this, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Miracles actually lead people to repentance. It was the miracle of seeing the great haul of fish with Peter's nets that caused Peter to run to the feet of Jesus and throw himself at Jesus' feet and say, I am am an unclean man. Woe is me. He was repenting before Jesus at the great harvest of fish that came into his business. Miracles are a manifestation of the glory of God. The Bible says in John 2.11, this, the first at the wedding of Cana of, of Jesus' miracles that he did and manifested his glory. When miracles break out, the kingdom of God is coming near, people are being led to repentance, and the glory of God is breaking into the natural realm. You've got to understand that God is spirit first and foremost. He is an eternal being. You and I have been made in His image and likeness. We are not just human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spirit beings having a human experience. It's not to discount or dismiss the reality and the blessing of our humanity being made in the image and likeness of God. But you just need to understand you are hardwired for the supernatural. If you don't expect God to move miraculously in your life or in your ministry, three things happen. Firstly, we deny the power of godliness in Christianity. Bible talks about in 2 Timothy 3, 5, that in the last days, people, believers, will have the appearance, the form of godliness, but deny the power of it. 
In other words, they'll look religious, but they won't have any spiritual power. They'll look like they've got the form, but they lack the power. Secondly, if you don't expect God to move in the miraculous, there are people around you whose needs won't get met. There are people around you that won't get ministered to. And lastly, if you don't expect God to move miraculously, you misrepresent the gospel. And one of the greatest problems with a powerless church is it presents to the world an inferior view of who God is. Please don't misrepresent this gospel message that Jesus lived, died and rose again for. Let's not present to the world an inferior view of who our heavenly father is. Peter and John are going to the temple at the hour of prayer, which tells me they had a lifestyle of prayer. If you want to increase supernatural activity in your life, you've got to find your hour of prayer. You've got to find that lifestyle, that rhythm in your life where it's just a normal part of your life to lock yourself in that closet, to lock yourself in that secret place, shut the door and begin to seek God with everything within you. They come to the gate beautiful. There is a man that is lame from birth. He is a mature adult. That's why people are shocked after the miracle happens that this actually happened to him. He did not get injured. He was lame from his mother's womb and he's asking for money thinking that money is what he needed. Many of us think that the practical material resources of life are what we need. You may have a need for that, but there is a greater need and that need is that your thirsty and hungry soul needs to be satisfied with the rivers of living water that only Jesus can provide in your life. And so they're walking down Cavill Avenue and here is a man lame from birth asking for money and and Peter says, look at us and this lame man expected to receive money from them, but he got something that was far greater and far more important. I, my heart is saddened when, to be honest with you, in our secularized culture, Australia does not look to the church anymore for answers. It looks to industry, it looks to celebrities, It looks to athletes. It it, it looks to people who are successful in the eyes of the world. And if you're successful in this culture, people will look to you. But there was once a day where people used to look to the church for answers. And part of the reason why they looked to the church is is because the church was not just carrying the form, they were carrying the substance. And we actually need to begin to return to a renewal of the pattern that was shown us in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And and then also realize God doesn't want us to simply just go back. He wants to propel us forward because He said, even greater works than these shall you do. You see, the contrast between form and power can be seen in um, athletes. If you go to a gym, you bump into someone who's, you know, maybe a bodybuilder. And, and so they, 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 they look like they've got the form. And so they're there with their little five kilo dumbbell and they're pumping their, their bicep up. And, and it looks big. It looks amazing. But they're only lifting five kilo. And yet when I was at, um, in my early 20s, I went and watched the Australian Olympic weightlifting team train before the Olympics. And when I went there, there was this little guy who was 54 kilos who was lifting over his head three times his body weight. And I'm like, how is this guy doing this? He doesn't look strong. He doesn't look like he's got the form, like the bodybuilder lifting five kilos with his little bicep. 
but he has the substance. One has the form, the other has the power. Inside of his muscles, over many years of training, was a density of power to weight ratio that although he didn't look the part, he was carrying the substance. Let me tell you something. As cute as your outfit may be, what you look like does not matter. What the real issue is, do you have any power? Do you have any substance? Do you have any faith that can actually shift atmospheres and change people's lives? (coughs) Dress yourself up, do the best you can with what your mother gave you. But all I'm telling you is, In the kingdom of God, it's going to take more than a cute outfit to actually see transformation. It's going to take some faith and some substance and some power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says the kingdom of God doesn't consist of talk. It consists of power. You see, many Christians believe that the goal of Christianity is that we would be well-respected citizens in our culture. That is not the goal. The goal of Christianity is transformation. Transformation is about people who were once in darkness come into light. People who were once broken are made whole. People without purpose and destiny discover their calling. People who were lost are now found. People who had no call to leadership on their life are now leading and building God's house. The goal is not to be well respected by the government, by the media, or by corporate industry. That is not the goal. The more I read the Gospels and the book of Acts, the more I see they caused havoc everywhere they went. Not because they were trying to offend people, but because they were so hungry and captivated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hungry to see lost people saved. That everywhere they went, the the Bible says they turned the world upside down. If your goal is to be a well-respected citizen, you're missing the point of being a part of the kingdom of God. The goal is to... Walk with Jesus in such a way that we accurately and authentically represent Him in the world around us, thus bringing transformation. You see, we're brought into a lie as Western believers that says, I've got to be a better Christian in order to walk in more power. As if you can earn supernatural power. That's a a law mentality not a grace covenant. You see, it's not a choice between character or power. It's both end. It's not a choice between fruits of the Spirit or gifts of the Spirit. So what a lot of Christians do go, well, if I can't access the power of God and I can't access the gifts of the God, let's just emphasize the fruits of the Spirit. And yet Jesus was the Son of God. And yet the Bible says in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon Him because He has anointed Him to preach good news. If the Son of God had to be anointed with power to carry out His ministry, how much more you and I? It's character that sustains the demonstration of the power of God. There's lots of people, though, that have no fruit. I've met a bunch of them, and I myself have been through seasons where there's been a lack of the fruit of the Spirit in my life, yet God has moved in my life and through my life amazingly because they are grace gifts. And where God finds the principle of faith in operation, He moves through them. That's not to justify a lack of fruit. It's just to say it's not a choice of either or. We need both and in our lives. We need the character of God and we need the power of God. You see, the solution to powerless Christianity is to live out of an increasing revelation of who Jesus Christ is. Live out of an increasing revelation of who Jesus is. Peter said, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What did Peter have? Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was. And wherever someone has a revelation of who Jesus is, you will carry authority to influence the supernatural realm. Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 16, 
who do people say that I am? He wasn't sort of, you know, checking his Instagram account to see how many followers had actually were following him and, and, and he wasn't taking a poll to work out how many people uh, thought that he was popular or this and that. He was wanting to see and check where is the revelation factor at amongst the people? What do they really believe about me? And then he says, who do you say that I am? Because it's not enough for just your pastor to have a revelation of who Jesus is. You have to have a revelation of who Jesus is. Some of us are living vicariously through our small group leader's revelation of Jesus. Hello, somebody. Some of us are living through the guest minister's revelation of who Jesus is. No, no, no. I, I'm not going to be there when the doctor's report comes down the pipeline to you. I'm not going to be there when it goes, you know, I'm not prophesying now, but, but the reality is in this world, you're going to have tribulation. My paraphrase is life will become pear-shaped at some point in your life. Your pastor may not be there. He loves you and the team here loves you, but they may not be there. It'll be your revelation of who Jesus is that will sustain you. It's not who do other people say that he is, who do you say that he is? Because wherever someone has a revelation of who Jesus is, there Jesus comes and builds his church upon that revelation. In other words, he builds his kingdom on the backs of people that know who their God is. Those who know their God, Daniel eleven thirty two, shall be strong and do mighty exploits. You see, we've got to stop living vicariously for someone else. Why? Because you can't give away what you don't own for yourself. What you don't carry, what you don't have, you can't give away. Bible said that Peter said, silver and gold I don't have on me right now. He was a businessman. He had access to finance. He just didn't have his credit card on him at that time to give into the love offering. He's just like, you know what? I don't have my wallet on me right now, but I tell you, I've got something better. I've got a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And what I do have and what I do carry, I am going to pass on to you. You cannot pass on what you haven't had a revelation of. And we've got, we got preachers and we've got pastors trying to bring cha- transformation in people's lives. They've got no authority to actually transform. I cannot help you in an arena of your life I have not already conquered myself. Where I don't have a revelation from God's Word or I'm walking in victory in that area of my life, I can't actually help you. What I can do is actually point you to the Word of God, point you to someone else who is walking in that authority and actually help you to get breakthrough in that area but please don't try and help people to get authority in an area where you are not walking in authority. So if you're walking in miraculous provision in your own life, then you can actually help people walk in miraculous provision. You can only impart what you carry yourself. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you shall be my witnesses. There's a connection between power and witnessing. When I was in the police force 20 years ago, we turn up to a crime scene and the sergeant would say, okay, go and get statements, go and find witnesses. And generally there'd be dozens of people at a crime scene, sort of the excitement of it and and it was quite a, a morbid thing, but people would hang around and watch and just observe. And people would come and you quickly worked out who were the real witnesses from those who were just passing on what we call hearsay evidence. And you'd start to ask some questions. And at first they'd say, oh yeah, I I, I saw it all. But then you worked out they were simply repeating what they heard someone else saw, what they heard someone else witness to. And so that Evidence was hearsay evidence. It's inadmissible in a court of law. You cannot present hearsay evidence 
many believers are passing on a hearsay witness to the world around them. They never walked in it. They never discovered it. They never grew it in, in their own uh, personal secret place with God in it, but they're passing it on and they're wondering why there's not breakthrough. I, I want to encourage you, don't become a hearsay Christian. Become a Christian that owns it, that carries it, that walks in it, and then you can impart it away. If you aren't an eyewitness, you're a false witness. And we've got to start to actually position ourselves to say, God, thank you for the stories. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for what you've done. But I want to see it in my own life. I want to move in it in my own life. We've got to contend for the miraculous. Miracles are not the market share of guest ministry. Miracles belong to every single believer in this room because this is your kingdom inheritance. If miracles are lacking in your life, don't be satisfied with simply accumulating knowledge. What a lot of Christians do is when the, the, the sort of the supernatural dials down, the sort of theoretical knowledge dials up. And, and they start to use the theology to justify the lack. If there is a lack of the supernatural, the lack is never on God's end. The lack is always on our end. And if your theology does not allow or does not make room for the supernatural and the miraculous in your life, best get an upgrade of your theology. Because the Bible shows us through Jesus' life, let alone the early apostles, let alone Genesis to Revelation, that we are in relationship with a supernatural God. And that there are supernatural happenings and events that take place in relationship with this supernatural God. Jesus did not say, greater knowledge than this will you know. Jesus said, greater works than these will you do. Knowledge must transfer to action. Knowledge must transfer to power. The chief obstacle to living out a revelation of who Jesus is, is to tolerate a Christianity where miracles are the exception, not the norm. You see, Matthew 10, 7, Jesus said, Proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Freely you've received so freely give. Jesus expected that miracles would be a part of the normal Christian life. So again, if there is a lack of the miraculous in our life, the lack is never on God's end because God is exceedingly good. He's eternal. He's almighty. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere present. There is no lack in God. It's not because it's a lack of God's will. The lack is on our end. The disciples, when they couldn't cast the demon out of the boy, came to Jesus privately and did not say, why couldn't you cast it out? They said, why couldn't we cast it out? And Jesus said, because this kind only comes out through real hunger in prayer and fasting. You see, salvation is free. But if you want to grow in a greater anointing, you're going to have to pay a price. No one wants to hear that. Everyone wants the anointing to come that breaks yokes and bondages to just simply be, you know, just by, because I believe it. Your faith will, will take you so far. And, and yes, it begins with faith, but then there is, a, there is a price to be paid, not as earning your salvation, but as growing in a richer anointing of God's Spirit upon your life. If Jesus had to do 40 days of prayer and fasting, the Son of God, before He began His ministry. What do you and I need to do? But we want miracles on the cheap. We want revival on the cheap. We just want to turn up to church Sunday morning and Sunday night and see the heavens open. But I'm telling you, it's going to require some hunger. It's going to require some prayer. It's going to require some positioning. It's going to require someone to get out of their comfort zone into the discomfort of someone else's life for revival to truly come. If God has revival intended for you, 
In fact, as He does for every single church in this nation, it'll only come because someone in this house took that word seriously and said, I'm going to position myself. I'm going to pray. It doesn't matter how long. It doesn't matter what people say. I'm going to seek God. And I'm going to be a carrier of the revival anointing upon my life and upon this house and upon this ministry. It's going to require you to get out of your comfort zone. You see, the issue when it comes to a lack of miracles comes back to a lack of hunger and a lack of renewal of our mind. If you're not, if you're not hungry for the things of God, you're not going to see a move of God's Spirit. I remember I was in Adelaide last year and I was at a prophetic meeting and God shows me this man and uh, I see this 19, I see this black and white Chevrolet, this muscle car with the number 1957. And God showed me, and I start to tell this man this picture, God showed me that th- this man was driving this car, it was his pride and joy. There was an issue in the engine of the car that he couldn't fix. He called this uh, chief mechanic to sort of come and fix the um, engine block of the car and, and what he couldn't fix, this specialist mechanic came and fixed. And then he jumped in his car and drove off into the sunset. And God gave me the interpretation. I said, you are that like that 1957 black and white Chevrolet. And uh, you're here tonight because you're hungry because there's an issue in your life that you haven't been able to fix. Little did I know his wife and kids were sitting in the same row. Little did I know none of them were believers. And they're all sitting there invited to this meeting and he starts to weep. And I said, Does, but I said, tonight you've come to the chief shepherd, the chief mechanic of your soul and he's going to minister to you and he's going to fix this thing in your life, right? I start to give this word of knowledge. I said, does any of this make sense to you? He says, I am a mechanic that specializes in fixing muscle cars. And this afternoon in my auto shop, I was working on a black and white Chevrolet that was made in 1957. Who do you think was the first family out the front in the altar call, giving their hearts to Jesus, surrendering their life to Christ, Because true prophecy reveals the secrets of people's hearts and causes them to fall down at at the feet of Jesus and say, surely God is in your midst. I'm telling you, God wants to move in this house, through your life in this way. But until you expect it, until you contend for it, it's not going to happen. Cessationist says miracles are off the menu. Have you ever been to a restaurant where you began to order stuff and they said, uh, that's not on the menu, we've run out of that? Have you ever been? Le- no, 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 that's right. I went to a restaurant in Melbourne one time, three things I wanted to order were off the menu. I was ready to throw the menu at the waitress and I'm like, you tell me what I can order because apparently nothing I order is on the menu. The kingdom of God is not like that. Miracles are still on the menu of God's Word. The miracles are not just meant to be for the book of Acts or or, or the Gospels. Miracles are supposed to be what we walk in and what we live in in our life. You tell the patient who had stage four cancer in Glen Eagles Hospital in Singapore that miracles are off the menu and they'll tell you after prayer and anointing with oil, stage four went down to stage one and they got miraculously healed. You tell the believer at our prayer and fasting season who three days before the end of 21 days prayer and fasting needed an exact amount of $200,000 and they received it as miraculous provision and they'll tell you miracles are still on the menu. 
You tell the Singapore businessman that I met last weekend in Singapore who told me they were at our church two weeks ago on a Sunday night. They received a word of a curse being broken over their lives of of injustice, of, of all sorts of misrepresentation, false accusation. And the word came on the Sunday night. It is now, the curse is now broken. God is righting all the wrongs. In 24 hours, a six-year legal battle with the Indonesian government was cancelled in one phone call where a government official said, we are dropping the investigation. We're dropping all of the charges. We apologise for any inconvenience that this caused you. You tell him that miracles are off the menu. Miracles are still on the menu. You tell 27 barren couples that miracles are off the menu. They'll say, no, no, no. My, my family, my story is, is a miracle story. Miracles are still on the menu. How, how do we integrate the miraculous into our lives? We exercise faith in Jesus' name. You guys are just going to have to keep waiting there. That's, that's cool. I'm, I'm gone. So <clears throat> I appreciate the support. Thank you so much. Verse 16 of this passage, Peter said, By faith in His name. Which name? Jesus' name. By faith in Jesus' name has made this man strong, whom you see and know, And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man this perfect health in the presence of you all. You see, the source of the miracle was faith in Jesus' name. So few miracles happen because we are too busy trying to make our name famous rather than Jesus' name famous. If you be less concerned about your name being in lights and more concerned about Jesus' name being in lights, miracles will follow you. We're so caught up in a, a celebrity culture and it's come into the church and there's nothing wrong with having heroes of the faith. God raises up people and He pulls down people. But the issue is, what is your motive? What's your agenda? Why do you want that? Because as long as you want your name to be famous, miracles won't follow you. As great as your name is, as great as Pastor Justin's name is, my name. Don't, don't start walking around going in the name of Justin, be healed. It's not going to help you. In the name of Corey, be healed. In the name of JJ, be It's not going to help you. But there is a name that's above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when you begin to exercise faith in the name of Jesus, miracles start to happen. It's an amazing reality. But where you don't have a revelation of His name, where you don't have faith in His name, there won't be any miracles. But the moment you start to walk in this and say, Father, would you give me a brilliant picture of who Jesus really is? Would you show me, would you open the Scriptures to me and help me to encounter the the living Gospel in the form of Jesus? And would you mark my life with this gospel? Would you imprint my heart with this gospel? And as your heart gets imprinted and as your life starts to become transformed by a revelation of Jesus, you start to carry miracle working power. Things start to happen. Things start to shift in your life. There is power in the name of Jesus. And Jesus has given every believer access to that name. Jesus said in John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see, what we've got to do, what we've got to do, Surf City, is we've got to get out out of our comfort zone and we've got to get into the discomfort of other people's lives. Wholeness is meant for brokenness. Supply or fullness is meant for lack. Power is meant for weakness. And many of us want power. We want fullness. We want sufficiency. 
But all that's happening is we're getting spiritually fatter and we're not actually imparting to others who are broken, who are uncomfortable, who are lame, who, 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 who are poor. We're not imparting that which we've been imparted with. Freely you've received, freely give. Peter took this man by the right hand, a point of contact, and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Notice he didn't just go, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then he stepped back and said, come on, rise up and walk. Come on, what's wrong with you? Get with it. He he declared his revelation in the name of Jesus. And then he stepped into the brokenness of this man. And he said, I'm going to help you. He lifted him up. And as soon as that point of contact happened, he was supernaturally healed in that moment. You see, the power was Jesus, but the hand was Peter's. The power was Jesus, but the hand was Peter's. There's no lack in Jesus' power. The issue is there's a lack of the hand. There's a lack of engagement. There's a, there's a lack of connection. There's a lack of content. Our culture says, keep your faith private. Jesus says, take your faith public. We are the Spirit's public. Take your faith public. Let me tell you, I, I, I'm, we had the Prime Minister come to our church at the start of this year. Within 48 hours, I got a phone call from the Prime Minister's office. He's his family's coming to worship at your church. I'd never experienced anything like this before. And our team sort of was like, you know, went into meltdown. They're trying to get everything perfect and right. And I just said, everybody chill out, right? We have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with us every single week. We're going to honour, we're going to love, but chill out. We are going to be ourselves. We're going to see the power of God move. And I preached my head off. I went for it, right? I talked about how to have the best year of your life. And I looked at the Prime Minister the whole time. It worked. (laughs) Whatever your political persuasion is, it worked. And so, let me tell you, our Prime Minister is a Christian, yes. Is spirit-filled, yes. I met his family, beautiful family, humble He prayed on our platform for God to move in our nation. But let me tell you something. The Prime Minister is not going to get the job done in this nation. You know who is? You know who's been called to? The Church of Jesus Christ. It's men and women of God who have a revelation of who Jesus is and the everyday experiences and circumstances of life in their businesses, in their families, at school, at university, in the streets of Gold Coast City. It's you and I that God has called to, but there's no lack of God's power. The only lack that exists is our hand. There is a miracle waiting for you, Sir City Church on the other side of your discomfort. You've got to get out of your comfort zone. I, I was, I'll finish with this. I was in London and I had a day off from preaching and I decided on the, that morning, I'm not speaking to anyone. I'm not ministering to anyone. This is my day. Have you ever had one of those days where you're like, this is my day off. This is my day. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I've been preaching my head off and I'm like, I need rest, Lord. I need a day out. So I decide I'm going to go visit the Queen. So I go, I got my wallet, I got my headphones, I go to the bus stop and I'm like, I'm feeling good. I'm going to visit the Queen. So I put my headphones in. I'm going to shut out the world around me. I'm in my comfort zone. I'm in my special happy place. And the bus is unusually late. And next to me, There is this human being made in the image and likeness of God that I'm ignoring, right? And they're looking at me like they want a conversation. And I'm sort of just casually turning my body away just to sort of look like I'm just focused on something else. You've done it too. Don't look at me. So like, don't judge me. You've done it too. And and so I'm there and I'm sort of turning away. I've turned my music up. No, Jesus, not today. 
I'm not talking. I'm not preaching today. I'm not witnessing today. I'm in my comfort zone. And the bus is like unusually late. And the Holy Spirit says, take the headphones out and talk to this guy. And I'm doing all my all I can to resist until finally, you know what happens. Jesus generally wins. And so I take the headphones out. And I turn to this guy and I start to have a conversation. And he asked me, what are you doing in London? And I thought, brilliant, this will kill the conversation. Because for me, when I tell people that I'm a preacher, generally the whole conversation nosedives or it just catapults forward. And that's where the fun really starts, right? And so I'm hoping, I'm trying to lay it on thick, you know, like I'm a fire-breathing prophet who's going to call fire down upon you if you keep talking to me. So just turn away, right? And, and, so, and so I'm laying it on thick and he's interested. He's like smiling and asking me questions. I'm like, dear Jesus, I just want a day off. And, and, and so the bus comes and we hop on the bus and I say, well, have a great day. He comes and sits next to me, right? We're on the bus 45 minutes. I didn't realize, but he missed his bus stop 20 minutes before. And we're talking about God and evolution, creation. We're talking about faith. And he tells me that his parents, as a little kid, raised him in the church. But for the last 20 years, he's walked away from God, walked away from it all, has not wanted anything to do with it. But I could see his heart starts to become open to the gospel. We hop off my bus stop and we're on a street corner in, in downtown London. And I looked at him and, and we're sort of looking at each other like, we're going to part ways now. But I, I'm like, now I'm like right up in his face because I'm like, well, if you're going to inconvenience me <laughs> on my day off, you're getting the full power, the full fire, the full, you're getting, and I just said, hey, I just said, you know, we've been talking about Jesus, and you've been talking about your past, would you like to recommit your life back to Jesus right here, right now? And he said, can I do that right here? I said, of course you can. And so I start to pray for him. I lay my hand upon his chest and, we, and he lifts his arms in the air in a street corner in London. And he starts to pray the sinner's prayer. And after he finishes the prayer, he starts to roar speaking in tongues. And I'm there and I'm like, just tone it down a little bit. And he's shouting in tongues. And, I, and I'm like, and so then I'm laying hands upon him. And then he's starting to get slain in the spirit. So now I'm the prayer and the catcher. You have to be very talented to do that, by the way. And so I'm sort of like this. And we're going lower and lower, lower. Meanwhile, like, you know, the Queen's bodyguards are walking around like, what the heck is going on here? And, but God showed up. And God miraculously saved this guy. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because someone was willing to get out of their comfort zone into the discomfort of someone else's life. Why don't you stand to your feet with me tonight? There is a miracle that's waiting for you on the other side of your discomfort. How hungry are you to see God use you, to see the miraculous come through you? we're going to worship in a moment I actually want to invite you tonight if you need a miracle in your life I'm actually going to invite the prayer team to come out but if you need a miracle in your life I want you to get out of your seat come and stand right now at the front if you need God to move miraculously I mean a miracle you need God to heal a sickness or you need God to move somewhere in your life I just want you to come and just stand at the front an addiction needs to be broken. Something needs to happen in your life. Just come and stand. Remember, it's not about how you feel. It's according to your faith. It's not about how you feel. It's according to your faith. And I'm just going to ask right now that there would be a prayer team that would just start to come and lay hands upon these people. And we're just going to begin to sing. We're going to begin to worship. And then I'm going to pray. Can the team come forward? Can we begin to worship and can we begin when to sing right now?